Wonderful. All right, looks like we have a good cohort. I think we should just get started and folks can filter in as they, um, as they come along. Um, yeah, okay, so let's get started. Welcome everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see so many faces, new and familiar. Um, welcome to the evocatively titled uh, Pictures We Keep, Secrets We Share, in which we've invited a renowned group of photographers, artists, and scholars to share the stories and details behind the works that form part of the publication and exhibition project, Keeper of the Hearth. So Keeper of the Hearth, as we'll hear in a moment, is a project which in turn pays homage to Roland Barthes' influential text, Camera Lucida. It's a kind of prose poem to the affects and effects of photography, and it celebrates its 40th anniversary of publication this year. So I'm sure that many of you are actually familiar with that text, um, and so you're coming to this with some of your own experiences, some of your own, uh, your, your own uh, references to that text, and of course to photography. So my name is Amy Halliday. Uh, for those of you who um, haven't met me before, I'm director of the Center for the Arts here at Northeastern University. And we're really delighted to host this event, uh, which celebrates this incredible project and includes a wonderful Northeastern photography professor, Dana Mueller of our own. So we're, one, we're really excited to uh, have her being part of this and to have uh, generated something uh, bigger and more, more expansive that came out of those initial conversations. Um, so I don't want to take too much time. Without further ado, I'm actually going to pass the proverbial mic over to our moderator, Dahlia Habib Linson, who's head of academic engagement at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, but also a really good and renowned photography scholar. And I think a lot of us who work in kind of museum education wear lots of hats and have to become generalists. And so it's wonderful to be able to dig into our areas of expertise in places like this. Um, so um, Dali is going to briefly contextualize the project in terms of the continued prominence of Camera Lucida today. And then we'll hear from Odette England, um, artist, photographer, educator, artist in residence at Amherst College, and the originator and editor of the Keeper of the Hearth project. So that's kind of how we, the, the um, session will play out. We'll then hear from our four guest photographers who are included in this project. Um, and after that, have a few questions and answers, including hopefully some from you. So if you'd like to leave a comment or a question in the chat, we encourage you to do so uh, at any time and we'll try to merge that in, or perhaps at the end, we'll even have a chance to ask you in person. So if you feel comfortable with that, we'd encourage you to just write RTS or write to speak, or I'm happy to be on camera or something like that. And we're, we can um, unmute you and have you ask your question at the end. We're likely to uh, run just beyond one o'clock. We understand some folks may need to leave after their lunch break, um, but we just think this conversation is gonna be really rich and exciting and may take us a little bit longer if you wanna stick with us th through all of that. Um, but at this point, I will hand you over to Dahlia. Thank you so much for all being with us. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you to Odette for the opportunity to moderate this session and to the entire staff at Northeastern who organized this panel. Let's see, and can I have the next slide, please, Amy? There we go, perfect. I first encountered Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida as an undergraduate student, enrolled in my second ever art history class, a history of photography from its inception to 1918. Upon being assigned Camera Lucida, I sat down prepared to apply my newly developing analytical skills to this text. Just a few pages in, it became clear that I would not only learn about photographs, but I'd begin to gain an understanding for methods of learning that resist distinct academic classification through ambiguity and paradox. Indeed, one of my favorite quotes from the book is this, quote, in order to see a photograph well, it is best to look away or close your eyes, end quote. This often cited intellectual and personal inquiry remains one of the most influential writings on the practice and understanding of photography. First published in 1980, just weeks from Bach's somewhat unexpected death, La Chambre Claire captivates, creates a captivating, if sometimes uneasy space of intertwined reflections on the power of photographic images and the certainty of loss. Through 48 short essays, propositions, Barth explores photography's mechanical nature, its cultural bearing, 
and the emotional reverberations it ignites. Seeking to come to terms with some of the medium's most beguiling aspects, he advances in the first part of the book, a type of theoretical framework using terms that you can see here in the table of contents, such as operator and spectator, referent and subject. And when his own language comes up short, he draws upon the Latin words studium and punctum, where the former refer refers in Barth's terms to quote, a general enthusiastic commitment, end quote, uh, or otherwise known as the photograph's general background information. The latter, the punctum, functions as an element that pricks or pierces. It's that salient, peculiar detail that strikes the viewer's attention. If in part one, Bart seeks to impose order on the experience of being in and looking at photographs, part two is rooted in the futility of trying to do so with any sense of objectivity. Written in the depths of personal grief, this part of the book opens with Bart searching through old photographs for some verifiable trace of his recently deceased mother. Pursuing at the same time the evidence in photography with quote, the truth of the face I had loved, end quote. He locates both in what he refers to as the winter garden photograph, a time weathered image of his mother Henriette at the age of five, standing with her brother on a bridge inside a glass conservatory. And although he chooses not to reproduce it, for the reader, it would simply stand as, quote, one of the thousand manifestations of the ordinary, end quote. The photograph reveals for Bart not only that essence of his mother's unique being, but in effect, the capacity of a photograph to stand for, quote, a certain but fugitive testimony. It's that quality of assurance he often calls that has been. So like the notion of that punctum, the photograph paradoxically confirms the existence of a loved one, just as it wounds with the awareness of death's inevitability. Indeed, it's perhaps that unresolvable tension between presence and absence, love and loss, now and then, that activates the Winter Garden project that we'll discuss today. Camera Lucida, if I could have the next slide, please, Amy, thank you. Car Camera Lucida is often characterized as a text foundational to the study of photography. Reprinted in well over a dozen editions, and here I'm showing you just six, most recently it will be published as a vintage publication to be released this December. It continues to be examined through publications, exhibitions, artist projects. It's found on countless reading lists and syllabi and websites. In pondering Camera Lucida's persistent resonance, one might look to the unfixed nature of photography itself, shifting as it does repeatedly in form while its role expands in culture, in personal and social life. Yet one may also look to the book project at hand here that yields an array of responses as varied and distinctive, as unrestrained and unclassifiable as the imaginations of its contributors. So with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Odette England to tell us a little bit more about the project. Thank you so much, Dahlia, and welcome to everyone who is listening and watching today. This project really began in the winter of 2017. I was living here in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was renting the former home of the American mid-century photographer, Harry Callahan. And his darkroom basement in this house is still mostly intact, and you can see it there on screen on the left-hand side. So I had a year to spend time enjoying this space and researching uh, Callahan's work. And I was particularly taken by the many images that he made of his wife, Eleanor, and their daughter, Barbara. And it got me thinking about how artists mediate the parent-child relationship, and in this case with Harry Callahan, the father-daughter relationship through the act of photography. 
At the same time, I was trying to finish some study and I was rereading Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida and thinking more about this unseen winter garden photograph that he refused to share. And thinking too that there's every chance that there isn't a person alive today who has seen it, if it exists at all, because there's some theory that perhaps it was a figment of Bart's imagination. Now, Bart lived with his mother his entire life. He never married. And so in a sense, she was the love of his life. And when she passed away, he was understandably traumatized. And as Dahlia said, put enormous amounts of that trauma into the writing of the book and particularly the second half. So that got me thinking about, again, the parent-child and in this case, mother-son relationship as mediated through the act of writing about photography. So while living in Harry Callahan's home and thinking about Roland Barthes' unseen winter garden photograph and thinking about parent-child relationships as mediated through photography, my own daughter, who is on the right, was at that time about the same age as Henriette Bart is thought to have been in this winter garden picture. And I take photographs of her often. She looks back at me with this mechanical device in front of my face more often than not. And I watch her personality develop. And so those three things coming together and realizing that Camera Lucida would turn 40 this year led me to think about developing a project in which I could ask other people to consider a winter garden photograph of their own. So I reached out to a handful of friends and asked them if they'd be willing to do a something and they were keen. And so I went away and developed the project just a little bit further and decided I would reach out to photographers, curators, historians and writers and to contribute a physical print, a physical thing that would somehow honour or celebrate or relate to Roland Barthes' Winter Garden photograph in some way. And I thought it would be a book of maybe 40 people and then it was 80 people and then it was 140 people. And before I knew it, I had 200 people participating. And all of those 200 folks are represented in the book, which is Keeper of the Heart. And it was published in the winter of this year uh, by the wonderful Martin Schilt at Schilt Publishing. And it's 320 pages, mostly images, a few texts um, that talk about this unseen photograph. When developing any book project, there are always nuances and delights and surprises. And one of the things that surprised me was just how willing people were to share very personal stories that sit within, but also beyond and outside the frame of the images that they contributed. And some of those secrets are in the book and the careful reader of the book will discover these little secrets. And I, I don't like giving them away because I, I like the idea of people just finding them encased in, in this book object. But at the same time, there are tens of stories that are not revealed through those images. And that's why today's event is so special. And I'm so grateful that it's happening because four of the people who are involved in the project who very generously contributed, whose own artistic practices I'm a huge fan of, have agreed today to talk about not only some little secrets um, in their own work that they contributed, but also to share an image from someone else's contribution to the book um, and perhaps an insight of, of what, it, what, it has, what that particular image has meant to them. So I'm deeply honoured and grateful to introduce our speakers today, Barbara Bosworth, Bin Dan, Eric Gotsman and Dana Mueller, who are going to hopefully reveal some tasty, delicious, wondrous treats of secrets about their own work and then some of the things that they have found particularly interesting in another image of their choosing from Keeper of the Half. Am I just to start? Sounds great, Barbara. Okay. Oh, so hi everyone. This is the blessing and curse of having a last name starting with a B. I'm up first. So um, th thank you everyone for making this happen. I'm so pleased to be here and I'm so happy to have all of you who have joined us. I chose an image of a bird flying. This image is from Behold, 
a series I made during the time of both my mother's Parkinson's related dementia and my father dying. When my father was dying, literally on his deathbed, my mother reached for something she saw rising over him. When I asked her what she was reaching for, she replied very matter of factly, oh, the birds. Later as her dementia deepened, she continued to reach into the sky for something definitely there, but unseen to us. It's so always birds in flight, always longing for her lost loved one. For many cultures and many myths and stories, birds symbolize the human soul. Birds are thought to be transcendent and bearers of celestial messages. At times they are a symbol of immortality, death, and rebirth. The soul leaves the body as a bird in flight. This image began simply out of my enjoyment of watching birds. It is merely an image of birds flying from the bird feeder outside my house to the trees nearby. Yet I seem unable to separate what is happening in my life from the photographs I make. My father was dying. My mother was seeing birds in flight. These pictures then became my way of, to try, of trying to tell this story. At some point, it was no longer about watching birds at the feeder or even about my mom and dad, but about the utter mystery of life and death and wondering where do our loved ones go? And also, as may be an interesting side note, my father was fascinated by my migrating birds, often asking with equal pause, are ah, and worry, how do they know the way home? He was always worried that people would make sure, he wanted to make sure people knew how to get home. I chose Jem, oh yeah, thank you. I chose Jem Satham's swan image from his series titled Abandon the River as a companion image to speak about. It too is a bird in, of birds in flight, also in winter. In his image, the bird is flying over a river at dawn. In some myths, swans represent carrying the soul across a river into the afterlife. Jem speaks about how this series of swans in winter began as he was contemplating the imminent death of his younger brother. He writes, however, all these thoughts are generated after the making, not during the visits when I am just entranced by the theatrical space I am part of. It's very much a shared experience, the birds and I seeing in a new day, imagining how our minds might be working sorry, imagine how their minds might be working, what they might be aware of. It's just another day in their lives. What's going on in the world beyond of no importance or relevance. Gemini did not know of the other series while making the work selected here, but both series began in our enjoyment of looking at the natural world. And we both came to using birds flying in winter as a way to represent a sense of loss, longing, and as a way to contemplate these mysteries and to connect stories of the past to our lives. Bart, in or near the winter garden section of his writings, mentions studying his image of the girl, his mother, and rediscovering her. This is the heart of what photography allows me. It's time to look long at something, to hold on to it, and rediscover it and its meanings, to give a long look. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, this, um, thanks everybody for um, your, your attendance today and thanks for the invitation to take part in this project. And you know, when you accept it to, uh, to be part of a project, go, you go down a journey, you, you never know what, what could happen. And when Odette um, asked me to take part, I was really excited because I knew what I wanted to, um, to uh, present, which is actually this photograph of my mother, it's called um, Arranged Marriage. And this is my picture of my mother when she was uh, about 17, 17 years old. Uh, she, you know, it was basically in the, uh, the, the neighborhood. She was a single, single lady and it was a way for um, families to arrange, um, you know, their, their, their kids. So I kind of credit photography as um, bringing my, my mother together. Um, and so I found this picture in a, a photo album and I just was, you know, I, I'm not really good at reading Vietnamese. And I asked my mother, like, what is this translation? And she said that that means a lonely person on a boat. So it's kind of, you know, signify you're single, uh, you, you need somebody. Um, and, 
it also happened to be that the man that she, she, she's going to be arranged, my father, uh, you know, a couple of years, not a couple of years, like decades later, in 1978, took the family, including me, on a boat as refugees to uh, come to, to the United States. So yeah, I knew I wanted to present this picture. So it wasn't hard to find a picture. The hard part was um, moving on to the next slide is to, uh, you know, to, to um, pick a picture from the book. And it took me several passages just to find a picture. And I kept coming back to this one here by the artist uh, Kamanse. Um, and it's, it, it was a mystery to me because every picture in the book doesn't have any caption at all. I, I, you know, I, I did some research on the artist. I found out, you know, she was, um, she is the 2018 Aperture Portfolio Prize winner. And when I look at this picture, it was a picture that I'm really familiar with. You know, it looks like it was a banquet. Um, you know, which now reading today, actually this morning, looking at the slide, reading the caption on it, um, you know, the earliest existing photographs of my mother, which kind of paralyzed the picture of my mother, which I believe is the earliest picture I have of her. And this one here is just, again, it's just so magical because, you know, it represents um, the woman within the family structure um, and again, so then, you know, going down further pages in, in, in the book, and if you uh, move to, to the next slide, this pictures appear again, too. And again, I was like, wow, what's, what's going on? What, you know, what's this picture mean? And I, is it being passed? Again, I have no, uh, recol I have no idea what, what the, the, the caption of this picture. So it was all a mystery to me until I, again, you know, online, I, I I watched a video of the artist talking about her work and I noticed the calculator watch <laughs> she was wearing. So then it, it appears in this picture here. So I knew that was the artist's hand. Um, and I couldn't tell like, you know, the other two hands, if they were Anglo hands or the Asian hands. So um, the mystery now is solved just from uh, participating today. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say. I, I, I you know, I look forward to uh, your questions later on. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is wonderful to be a part of. Thank you so much for pulling it together and Odette for, for this project, um, which has been such a pleasure. Uh, my, my photograph um, that I submitted for this project is from a series that I, uh, I've done called Preservation of Terror. Um, I've worked for the last 20, off and on for the last 20 years in Ethiopia and I've learned a lot about the history of um, Ethiopian uh, art and photography and literature and uh, also about government controls and censorship over, over free expression. And one of the things I learned is that during the um, Derg regime, uh, which lasted during the 70s and 80s until 1991, um, public use of cameras and photography was pretty much outlawed. Um, people were, you know, the camera was seen as a threat. Uh, and so in this series, I'm revisiting that time through studio photographs um, that people made in official government sanctioned um, sort of photographic studios that were allowed to make photographs. It was really the only place people could see their images made during that time. And this, this photograph specifically, there are stories behind all these images that, that I'm collecting or that I collected, I should say. Um, this, this, the story of this image is that the boy on the left uh, had gone missing during that regime. And the, the woman on the right is his mother. And the woman on the right carried around the left half of this photograph for many years, trying to find her son. She would ask people, have you seen my son? Have you seen my son? And, and uh, nobody had seen him. Um, and finally, somebody said to her, you know, I'm sorry, I think your son has disappeared, meaning that he was probably um, imprisoned or, or assassinated. 
uh, during a very turbulent time. And so my, the, the woman that was talking to the mother here said, but let's go to the studio. And she went to the photographic studio and made a double exposure. The photographer made a double exposure and put the mother together with the son in the photograph, which she then carried around with her accruing all these marks and scratches, which to me stand in for what is lost during that time. Um, if you can go to the next slide, as I was looking through the book, um, this one stuck out in partly because I know Stanley uh, Wolokao Wanambwa, the, the photography, photographer here, um, but we had never really spoken about this photograph. And when I look at this photograph, I don't really know the context of what it is. Um, but the way it is in the book, there, there is no context, but I, I believe I do know something about it. Well, first, what I see is a, a stuffed rabbit, uh, you know, kind of deflated and taped bound, bound to the, this pole um, with other uh, faceless, um, you know, figures also bound to the pole. I think this is an image from the Michael Brown Memorial in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and the, um, you know, the, so this was, this was a, mem a, a kind of like crowdsourced memorial of stuffed animals and various things that were brought together to memorialize the, the police killing of, um, of Michael Brown, a young 18 year old Michael Brown. Um, and it struck me in thinking about uh, this panel because I remember that uh, Bart was, had refused to reproduce the Winter Garden photograph because he was afraid it would be an indifferent picture. Um, and the indifferent, that, that word indifferent, the idea of an indifferent picture, something that the viewer could not really relate to um, because, you know, in the way that, that uh, he, Bart, could relate to that image of real loss. And it spoke, I think, um, of, of a few things uh, in relationship to, to Stanley's photograph here. Um, first, I think there's, there's, there's this visibility and non-visibility and super visibility uh, of black people in a culture in which they have been persecuted and subject of, of violence and state violence. Um, and I, I think it raises the question of how we visualize loss due to violence or otherwise in a way that's not indifferent. Um, or is all photography indifferent? Is it impossible to, to really relate through the image um, to someone else's experience? But then, you know, all this series of questions keeps occurring to me. If, if that's so, how do we reconcile the fact that the image of Derek Chauvin kneeling on the neck of George Floyd inspired um, so many people to actually take action. Um, and it, it makes me think that perhaps as with loss and, and grief, the indifference of photography changes over time. Sometimes the photographic image can stimulate something real uh, or you know, outside of the viewer's experience. And at other times, it's just another stand-in for something that we will never experience. And, um, and so when I, when I really come back to Stanley's picture, what strikes me about it is the vulnerability of this stuffed rabbit here. Um, and that somehow as a deflated, kind of rained on, weather beaten, hollowed out memorial for Michael Brown, the, the image of this poor rabbit somehow does evoke empathy. Um, and somehow it's, it's a more effective memorial for, for this young black man killed by state violence than the images that we saw used to describe him in the media, um, uh, you know, as, uh, yeah, basically used to describe him in the media. And so just to finish off, I, it just, I wanted to bring up the idea that one way of reading what Bart was pointing to when he was talking about um, the Winter Garden photograph as an indifferent image uh, was the need for a viewer to have a vocabulary of loss to understand the loss. Um, and I think what Stanley's applying to here is, or, or is referring to here is, is thinking about applying that need for a vocabulary to our lack of a vocabulary in photography uh, around race, violence, and personhood. Um, 
thank you, uh, Odette, for bringing us all together. Um, and thank you also to the incredible Amy Holiday and the staff at Northeastern for making this happen. Um, as Dahlia and Odette have mentioned, uh, one can enter Bard and specifically his reflections on the search, uh, in the, on the search of the Winter Garden photograph in various ways. One is to perhaps discuss photography and mourning, the act of mourning. One is uh, photography as a study of an archive, in this case, the family album. Or we can discuss photography's failure to speak, as Bart says. Uh, he mentions that one can never completely summon up a totality of the subject. Well, in this case, we're looking at a photograph of my mother who holds a bundle of wild flowers. In fact, this image is proof of many failures of taking photographs of my mother. Over the years, I consistently was looking for capturing a portrait of her that was honest and just. Um, and often I traveled to Germany in the past 10 years. I spent a very short time. I live now in the US, uh, about 10 days. And uh, it is always a challenge to um, conduct those, those sessions. But the image was taken in the garden of my childhood home uh, where, where all my family still reside. And so there were many photographs preceding this one. And when this picture came about, I felt it was good. Um, not good enough, but a good picture, finally. And of course, there are sometimes expectations um, on the part of the sitter or on the part of the photographer or both. Uh, and those expectations are usually not met. Um, there is always a gap between, between intention and what we are actually looking at, the results, right? Um, but trust is important and every portrait that involves a personal connection to the subject um, is a collaborative act. And her gestures, he, gesture here, her action to me, um, even though incomplete, we don't really see her face, is a gesture of giving or handing over the flowers, right? Um, even presenting the flowers to someone, perhaps. It's an act of giving and an act of affection which to me speaks to my mother's generosity and kindness and her desire to connect. Um, and it taught me a lot over the years um, in terms of various ways of how can one withdraw oneself and just simply give. And so the photograph is the result of this kind of performance too between her and myself, kind of figuring out how to navigate the space between us um, and a performance on how two people engage with one another while we take pictures. Um, and in some ways she sort of gave herself to me and she allowed me to make the image. Um, and I wanted to make the image. And uh, so it encapsulates the whole activity of collaborating to make a portrait of her, for me at least. So Bart's search, um, when he, for the Winter Garden photograph, um, through the pictures of his mother, is based really on grief, but also is based on love. And, um, and it was my attempt to make a, a, a just picture of my mother. Um, however, and I'm not quite done with my mother's image though, sorry. <laughs> There's always uh, an incompleteness, you know, her face is not seen, as I mentioned before, there's sort of the, um, we don't see the, her identity really, and the photograph points to this gap, uh, or inability of photography to capture the whole, as I mentioned before. But it allowed me to conjure up an image that I wanted to see, uh, that there's really no conflict between how she appears in the image and the way I want to think of her. Um, I can project the image that I want in some ways onto her. And I think also it's because we all carry uh, within us, in our imagination, perhaps an image of uh, the person that we love, an image that we cherish. So moving on now to the photograph that I've chosen to talk about, um, the image is just absolutely fascinating to me. I mean, it doesn't reveal any meaning at all in some ways, right? It is very open and in terms of what it 
when it was taken, the location, it, the activity it, itself is so strange. And I'm attracted to it because it is so different. The entire picture is a combination of mystifying details. Uh, the buildings, which are very strange and somewhat institutionalized looking, the cliff, the figure, the figure sort of awkwardly climbing the, the, the hill. It is grainy, it has soft focus. And what's interesting to me is that it's an awkward photograph. It does not fall into the conventional, uh, to, into the conventions that we usually associate with making a picture. Uh, so what's, what makes it special to me and even memorable is this precise awkwardness um, that breaks photographic conventions and um, the lack of detail. Uh, and it even begins to kind of break down in terms of clarity. So this could be an example of photography's possibility maybe to narrate without any context. I mean, we don't know really what's going on, why the picture was taken, who the individuals are. It, it remains all anonymous and hidden. Um, and I start speculating or the viewer starts speculating and that's all, all you know, sort of the only thing that's left to us. And I question if the figures are fleeing from something or one speculates, why would they go up the steep hill? Or even what lies outside of the frame, right? So there's always this wonderful paradox in photography and that's why I love photography, it depicts the real, an absolute replica of what we see, um, but it also can mystify or mystifies the subject at the same time. And in fact, we, when we look at this image and we really have, we have really no idea what is going on because of its failure to narrate. Um, and what gets me about the photograph is that they are so close to reaching the top of this, this hill. Um, the ground seems covered in snow or maybe it's sand. Um, and the woman's legs seem kind of fragile in their barrenness. And the push up the hill is never really complete. It's never complete. It's a kind of, um, it's, 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 it's never complete. And so the fascination of, of uh, the mystery, what is about to happen or what's gonna happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. So I think we'll move to our next segment to discuss together some of the themes that have emerged in our conversation. So I was really struck by, and this isn't something that I had observed as we looked at the images before our session today, but the way in which many of the observations uh, that you all have made of the photographs that you've submitted and those that you've chosen to discuss, um, the familial connections and thinking about the sort of generational connections that have emerged um, in the photographs. And I was thinking a lot about um, the notion that is, is so, clearly laced throughout Camera Lucida, but sort of goes without saying, which is this idea of vulnerability, something that I think really ties Bart to the study and fascination of photography and sort of desiring to connect in this way that feels so tangible, um, but recognizing an, an inability, right? Um, so I'm struck by that as sort of a theme. And then I'm also thinking a lot about this notion of what remains forever an immaterial object in that winter photograph. Um, as Odette has mentioned, and as many of us know, it's a photograph that not only is not reproduced in the book, but as some speculate may have never existed. So I wonder, as you ponder the role that photography plays now in our world and in your own practice, and if you think about sort of the the sense of immateriality with which we all live with photography today and how it exists in digital forms and in many ways on our phones that feel so ephemeral. Um, sort of what role does materiality play in your work in photography and in your 
reflections on the power of photography and this idea of loss. Um, I might jump in here, but for me, a lot of photography um, is, is there's a memory aspect to it. So a photograph becomes a memory and it holds my memories. And um, that might be connected to what you're talking about here, Dahlia, but um, it may also not be connected. But there's something about, for, for me, having the physical photograph, I guess one could debate that, yes, even my iPhone can provide this memory sense but for me maybe it's my generation that i love having the the object of an old photograph that i can sit down and look at and a lot of things i don't know if i remember it because it was in a photograph when i was two years old or did i actually remember that that skirt or that um chair i was sitting in i don't know it's I, they become my memories so i think for me that's a lot of the power of photography i think photography is powerful in many ways but that's one of it for me is this sense of memory and that i can hold on to a picture of um lost loved ones and i still then have them and they're there i don't know yes for me it's kind of twofold for me it's the process of making the image um, which has its own relationship and and happenings and events which really lie outside of the actual photograph. And that to me is always fascinating. And then the process of looking for your photographs and then creating a kind of context beyond it is, is sort of its own, its own thing. And um, I think we all are always kind of, uh, we, we always have a kind of longing or a desire to know and what is happening or the, you know, and I think photography just lends itself so beautiful beautifully to investigate that. And um, in terms of the materiality, I'm not sure. I think I'm just thinking of it as two different processes, mm -hmm. the making and the looking, the act of looking. I just want to add um, the, the winter garden image is quite magical for me too, because um, even though we don't see the picture in the book, but I, I have a picture of that in my mind mm -hmm. from the description of it. And it, it becomes mine in a way. It, I see that picture, I see it. And I think that's kind of like, again, we have a photographic mind, you know, where that's how we relate to the world. Um, and, and, and also how we relate to the past. And I was just talking to my student the other day and we were talking about nostalgic, you know, and for me, um, nostalgic is something black and white, you know, a picture of my mother, or a picture of my great grandmother's funeral in Vietnam. And we, we were just trying to project what's nostalgic 20 years later, for 50 years later for, for, our, for our students. And we were talking about like Instagram and all that kind of feeling of bright colors and stuff. So it's fascinating too, just, just the thought about it. And that's the reason why I like the Roland Barth book is because it's, it, it actually, brings kind of photography really down to this primal level, you know, primal understanding of, of, of photographic imagery, you know, and, and it, it's a hard thing sometimes for early um, beginning photo students to digest, but once you help them break it down, it's really simple, you know, like the studium, the punctum, try to identify that in the photograph, and then there comes the magic of what a, a photograph could reveal. I guess I asked the question of like, it's <laughs> gonna sound weird, but does, does it matter? Um, like I look, uh, Dahlia, as you were asking the question, I looked at the drawings behind you, um, which I imagine are kid drawings. And I think about like this drawer I have of kid drawings at my house that I can't figure out how to throw, what to throw away. And I keep trying to throw them away and then I put them in boxes to bring out to the trash, but then like, I can't actually bring myself to throw them away. But, but like, I really don't think any of those drawings for me matters that much. And, but what does matter is the development of watching my kids kind of, you know, grow and develop language and have conversations and, 
use a camera to have conversations like this, you know? Um, and so like, I, I, I wonder if in the infinite lens, like, does this matter? There was like this physics text I read over the summer that was like talking about, you know, how rocks and stones are actually like fluid if we look at it with enough time, you know? Um, and so, so I wonder if the winter garden photograph or any photograph that we can talk about is more than what it creates uh, as a ripple effect. Yeah, I think that's a great um, point to make. And I think it's something that particularly as the four of you were engaging with your com in the discussion of the photographs that you um, talked about, there was um, such a degree of tension between the photographs that are made and the photographs that are found. Um, and in some ways, the kind of um, way in which deliberation and chance sort of rub up against each other in a regular way and how that's so much a part of um, the medium, the practice of it, the understanding of it and the mystery of it um, as well. So yeah, I, I do appreciate that. And these are by my child, by the way, one of my children, the drama. Um, so I know that we have some, a couple of comments from our audience so we can certainly move in that direction. Um, or if any of you would like to respond to, if you're noticing in the conversation that's um, sort of moving between the four of you, a connection in that family, familial regard. Um, if anyone wanted to address that or to sort of think broadly about how we come to terms with as Bart so eloquently does, uh, an inability of photography to come to grips with the connection of family members that we will never encounter in this physical form again. So how, um, if anyone wants to talk about family, um, please feel free to do so. Well, I, I, I was just struck Barbara, by by um, the the fact that there are multiple pictures of two birds flying um, in the book, and when you, when you said it, you said Jem and I didn't talk about it, but I heard Jem and I, like um, like that. There's this kind of connection, and I wonder. Um, yeah, I wonder in in your thinking about um the loss of your parents like is that is it um yeah what's the relationship between that and recognizing someone else's loss oh don't know um do you mean like do i uh, um i think it's a pretty well a couple things i don't know if um what I think about losing my parents at all relates to anything Jem was feeling with the imminent loss of his brother, his younger brother. But I do think there are universal emotions that we go through, right, when we lose a loved one. Um, so I think in that level, there's certainly, I think, a universal connection, which is why I hope my pictures became more than about my mom and dad, but more about this more universal sort of feeling of loss and longing. Um, and I think it, I guess what I, um, I was struck by the fact that both these series of works from Jem and I um, took a similar path, right? And he, um, but neither, one's, neither one of us set out to do that, right? I think it's important to make a distinction between, I think several people have said this, that when you're out making the pictures is one thing, and then maybe what happens with those later is another thing, all the meanings we put on it, all the metaphors that might we bring to it, everybody brings something different to it. Um, but I found it intriguing that, um, that they're so, that both Gem and I had this similar sort of response to having a loss happening in our life and there we were photographing birds flying. On one level, it's just because we both love looking at birds. I mean, keep that in mind. It really started that it was just, I love watching these birds out my window. And that's all they were doing is flying from a feeder to the trees. So, and on one hand, Jem just loves being out on the river in the winter and here come the swans. It's just what happens to him later I find interesting in maybe some universal connected way. Um, I don't know, did I babble on that? Is that okay? Yeah, I don't know. 
we all we all feel something i think when people we care about are gone and where are they after that and i love being able to have a photograph of of my parents not just of a bird flying that might represent that but i love having the photographs of my parents that i can look at and you know they're scattered around the studio here where i can just look at them a lot and photography allows me to have that um yeah on one hand you're right maybe what does it matter photography we can live our lives just fine without photography in it but i love having them around and love having photography as part of my sense of holding on to things yeah eric you you pose a really interesting thought because i mean i guess it, i mean it matters it matters in our lifetime it matters within a generation but you know in the age of the cosmo it probably doesn't matter right <laughs> um but uh, but this quote by Christian Brutinsky always gives me chill is uh, he said you die twice you die when you actually die but you, and you die again when someone picks up a picture of you and don't know who you are and that's just like <laughs> just just the thought of that you know and there's a lot of pictures out there there's a lot of digital pictures out there that are you know like that's what photography is is a form of communication and um, not everything gets saved and not everything gets in context and captioned it, you know, in ways that, that it would matter. But uh, we do the best we can, I guess, as artists and educator to make it matter. I also think there's something about unknowing that goes around a photograph, whether the photograph represents loss in some way or it doesn't. Arguably, every photograph is an image of a form of a loss, but the knowing or the story or the piece of knowledge that sits within the frame but also outside of it is also somehow important. And if I use, the best way I can describe that is using the example of Kelly Connell's image in the book as just one example of the many that are like this where you see an image and there is a figure and the figure's face can't be seen and there's a background. So we know what we can read by the content of the image. What we don't see behind it is that the image was taken after Kelly's father had passed and that she was visiting the botanical gardens in Fort Worth and she was just taking pictures because she didn't know what else to do in this enormous feeling of grief. And that when she sent the image, and knowing that it would be the image for this project, that she wrote the letter about the image on New Year's Eve of that year. Now, all of that context and that information completely transforms that picture and makes the loss somehow much more resonant and powerful and pertinent because of a certain kind of knowing that goes around it. And that's true of almost every image anyway, but especially those that where there has been a loss faced by the person in it or the person who has made that picture. Yeah, and it ties completely to the paradox of how we, our relationship publicly or privately to images too, I feel in a sense that um, unfortunately, increasingly so, we, we are relating to images in a more public sphere. Whereas I think we should spend more time in some ways um, navigating and negotiating images in a private space. And I don't know what I mean by that necessarily, mm -hmm. but I think creating the context we, around them within our private relationships to images that are meaningful to us um, should be just at the forefront, uh, um, I think, in terms of, you know, relating to images. Dahlia, I wonder if we can uh, call on Julia now. I, I see we have, um, Julia's interested in asking her question. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. And thank you to all the panelists. This has been really wonderful. Um, I did wanna kind of return to something that Barbara was saying about the idea of forming memories around photographs. And I just have um, a curiosity about what everybody on this panel thinks about the future of that kind of memory formation with this increase in image capacity and retention, right, where every moment kind of gets saved and savored in a whole new fashion 
as a result of social media and digital cameras and camera phones and the like. And sort of what that might indicate for something like a special moment uh, now that every moment is kind of surveilled and, and put into a repository. You can imagine what it might be like now for someone a generation or two from now to be doing what Bart was doing in terms of that experience of looking through old photographs. What does that look like? And I guess I can only speak for myself. I don't really know how this next generation is doing it, but I choose, this is probably why I choose to not, um, I limit my time on, I, I do do Instagram, but um, I limit my time there. I don't do other social medias. I, um, I keep my treasured box of images to look at. So for myself, maybe there is a bit of a, a concerted effort to sort of make sure it stays um, um, special to me or something. But uh, you're right, I think, I, I don't know how to answer for this next generation too. And my hope is that they find ways to hold on to, um, to hold on to the special moments as well and not be so inundated. It is too much, it is too much. Was it, wasn't it Robert Frank who, oh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but he drove like a spike through a stack of prints and said the last thing we need is more photographs. And wasn't that like 30 or 40 years ago? And now we even have more and more. So I don't know, it's a lot out there. So I just wanna hold on to whatever is special to me. And I'm not saying my photographs I've made, but special box of photographs have come down to me from my great grandparents or my grandparents and my parents, I don't know. Or found photographs of some mysterious landscape somewhere. I hold on to these things, they're kind of special. You know, I mean, I was also thinking about this in regards to sort of how we recontextualize the photographs, which sort of ties into what Eric was talking about with that, with that image, right? Like there is this way for people who are maybe, I don't know, 40 or older <laughs> that have a relationship to the photographic print that is so different from a contemporary view of what a photograph is. Um, like a, a photographic image object in a gallery or museum is one thing, but having prints that you would keep on your desk or in your home as a kind of indicator of your relationship to people or places or, or what have you, that seems to be something that is no longer happening. So this kind of recontextualization of how we think about photography in the digital age is just something that I keep kind of bumping up against um, in my own practice and in, in teaching also. Yeah, I, oh, sorry. No, you, no, please, Eric, you go. Oh, I was, I was just gonna say, um, it reminded me of a story of when I was teaching a couple of years ago and one of my students, freshman or first year, um, said, um, it, it, she brought in a bunch of, a box of photographs from her grandmother uh, and was looking through them and we were all looking through them and they were amazing and they had writing on the back about what they were and and she flipped one over and she uh, and I said so what does the writing say and she looked at it and she said oh I'm sorry I don't read cursive and uh, <laughs> and, and the somebody next to her said oh oh I read cursive I read cursive you know like so wow. the idea that um, these like even just the literacy of what these things mean. I, you know, your question is really great, Julia. I also feel like as someone over 40, I am not gonna be able to answer that question, <laughs> you know, like, and, um, and I wonder if it will not at all look like what we know as photography. Maybe it has nothing to do with a camera or a lens or, you know, an object, whether it's a digital image or a physical print. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's only about context, you know, and, and it's only about the life that we live outside of these moments that are connected through the trajectory. You know, people were very worried about this too when photography was invented, right? I think they thought um, photography was the end of art. I don't, what, what was that? Was it, photography was the end of all art. And so I think people worried about us 
similar kind of thing then. And we got through that and we still, we still value paintings, we still value prints, and yet we've added photography into this. So maybe we'll find a way to add in all the new um, the way images are being um, shared and maybe we'll still learn to value the screen. The screen is very beautiful to look at, right? I mean, it's very seductive. It's bright, it glows, it's this little jewel. Just Love like it. fire. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll learn to maybe we'll learn to still find that the specialness within that because we've done it before. We, you know, the greater culture, we have done it before. So, and I wonder how the younger generation is reacting to our conversation right now yeah, right. in That's the room, right? I mean, they probably know best in terms of what right. what it how it all goes down. They're rolling their eyes right now at us, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not much different than what happened in the early days of photography with carte de visite or cabinet card, where you go over to a friend's house and they'll give you a little picture of them and you go home and put it in a cabinet and that's your Facebook back then. You know, so I think <laughs> the, the practice is still there. It's just, again, just trying to hold on to, as someone mentioned, um, sorry, forgot who, but about that these photographs just trigger memories, you know, and, and, and that's just like, that experience itself is, is so valuable um, beyond what the photograph happens to the photograph in the future. But that memory, while, while we're able to still perceive memories. <laughs> so I'm aware that it's just after one, and so some folks may have to leave us, but I encourage those of you who can stay uh, to stay with us. We're happy to chat a little bit more. Um, and I see we had a request to speak from Rebecca Sexton to ask a question. Rebecca, where are you? Hi guys. I really appreciate um, the talk today. I'm currently a graduate student, student writing my master's thesis on the role of inherited family photographs. So this is like super wow. wonderful. Um, I was wondering just to hear if you guys had any thoughts about the role of the inheritor um, most of what we've been talking about has been in the making or the, um, yeah, the making of the photograph. But I was wondering if, if as photographers, you had any thoughts about what it meant for someone else to inherit the objects or images that you're making. I, I think it's fabulous that, um, I think the person that I inherit images from had did some editing at some point. It's like what Eric was talking about, trying to decide what he's going to throw away and what to keep. Well, I imagine my grandmother, I don't think I have anything from the great grandparents, but certainly that my grandparents' generation. So at some point, what she saved, she deemed worthy. So I love finding these little snippets of my dad as a boy out in the middle of this field at the lake where they used to have spend some time. I just love that she saved that picture of her little boy who then became my father. So I don't know, if, what is that? What am I saying? I guess I, I guess I value that role of the, um, what she treasured then becomes a treasure of mine. And I guess I haven't thrown anything away that came down to me from them. So yeah, clearly they play a role. Um, yeah, I don't know, what is it we throw away? I'm, going through that part of my life right now. I got to get rid of stuff. Look at the mess here. Got to get rid of stuff. And what do we throw away? I don't know. I can't throw away these box of photographs. I'm not sure if we throw photographs away, but I remember as a kid or even as a young adult with the very few images that existed where I grew up, um, I was just fascinated looking, looking at them for hours. I mean, at time I would just sit there and even as a child, you recognize if they're family photographs, you sort of question, this is where I come from. Like, this is my context of my heritage. And you don't quite understand it, but it's right there in front of you. I think it's fascinating. I agree. I agree. Love looking at them. Hours. Maybe that's why we're photographers. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm definitely not the right person to answer anything to do with this because I steal images from my mum and dad, cut myself out of them, burn them, hole punch them, bury them and do all sorts of unspeakable acts to them. So I'm going to let everyone no, else who I, is much more precious than me no, <laughs> weigh in. No, no, no. Dad, I, I, think that, I think that that's still in a way that's keeping them, that's honouring them. I don't mean we have to be precious with them. What you're doing with them still honours and values them, don't you think? And you're preserving them just... You, maybe maybe a librarian in an archive would be upset with you for messing around with them, but. 
Oh, Barbara, I'm going to take you in my pocket next time I go see my folks. <laughs> and I wonder if you could respond to the, um, this, this notion of custody or custodialship or the idea of keeping um, or the idea of making in response to perhaps um, keeping. I wonder if you could talk uh, to Karen Haas's question about the daguerreotypes you made um, as a young photographer in relation to family, in relation to your own history, perhaps. Oh, I, this question is for me. I see. I, I missed the first part when you called my name. Um, so, yeah, well, you know, coming, coming for, to a country, not having much photograph and, you know, building that photograph collection from from day one on is something it's very, uh, so, you know, something I practice myself. I'm, I'm the family photographer, you know, I, I, do, I do all the photograph taking. It goes back to Rebecca's question too. It's like there is a burden to be the inheritor and also to carry on that legacy. Um, and, you, you know, I, you see tons of daguerreotypes of unknown people all over and someday that could happen to any of our archives right they, they could just go into some sort of so um yeah i i think in my own practice it's just trying to trying to um at least with the daguerreotype process um i haven't done too much portrait work but i'm gearing up to do that too especially during times when we can't really head out but also photograph people so it's a little difficult <laughs> that and but just a thought that um you know that it, the daguerreotype itself is is reflective, and you, you know if you think about nineteenth century daguerreotypes, you the viewer also see themselves in in the the, the 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 photograph. So so the viewer also becomes part of that image in that present moment. And I think that's what something about it is is that is is actually the present moment. It's like even though these are pictures of the past, when you look at it, it's it's a moment right there you're looking at, especially with a daguerreotype. And when, what I think about too, as all of us as, as here as artists and maker, is that we do what we do because we wanna, we wanna um, preserve the past, but we want, we want a future for these objects. So it's always constantly thinking about the future too, where we know that there's gonna be a future audience, hopefully looking at these pictures in a book or in a gallery. So it's always that, past, present, future, all kind of, you know, in a way jumbling up. And I, I, I mean, I don't think there's anything unique to being an artist, but it just maybe unique to being a human being. I have a question, if I may, <laughs> um, which is actually a question to Odette. I think I, I heard someone say earlier something about there not being captions in the book. I don't know if that's correct. I, I verified this morning. <laughs> Ah, so because I'm, I'm noticing that I had captions on the slides, um, but those are not obviously accessible and I haven't seen the book. And so there's something very different about individual images, about images set into motion in a particular kind, in a photo book, in a particular kind of project. Um, and then also in the exhibition format. So, which of course, um, I think we didn't mention that, of course, these incredible works are all part of an exhibition right now in Houston. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about the different formats of the book and the exhibition and some of those choices about things like captions. Sure, thank you. That's a great question. So the book, that's absolutely true. The book does not contain a single caption, not a year, not a type of print, not a series, nothing. They are images that float on the page just as they are. And there's no repository at the back for that information either. There's only a reference to the names of the photographers or artists who either made or contributed that picture. Part of the reason for doing that was that this was never meant to be a, um, an anthology type of book where you would clinically be able to assess all of the details about the picture because Bart's winter garden photograph is absent from the book, camera lucida, and full of words around it that describe it. So I really wanted this book to be a book where there were images and without words <laughs> to describe it. And there are a few short texts. There are three beautiful essays by um, Lucy Gallen and Philip Proger and Doug Nicholl 
But outside of that, the text is fairly limited. Um, so that was very intentional to do that, the opposite of what Bart does. In the exhibition at the Houston Centre for Photography, which runs through to the middle of January, and people who are in or near Houston can make an appointment to go and see it, all 211 images are displayed um, in that space. And they too do not have captions next to them. Um, I have all of the caption detail and a, I was describing to someone the other day, a very nerdy file alphabetized with everyone's letters and mostly handwritten letters talking about all this wonderful history that goes around their image. Um, with, uh, cards that, you know, really, uh, beautiful, lots in cursive, Eric, um, really, really beautiful stories. And at, when I first started the project, I did think about having some of those stories contained within the book. And then I thought separately afterward, oh, maybe I'll just do a book of images and then I'll do a book of the stories maybe a year or so later as a compendium. But they're almost too personal to share. I feel like there's something about an image that does something very different when you have the text separated from its owner. And if I publish all of those texts, I'm doing something that I don't feel, you know, outside of permission, I'd be doing a disservice to the intent of what these images were always meant to be, which is something that you sit in a quiet corner and you let the image wash over you and invest into you and crawl under your skin in a really beautiful, warm, cuddle kind of way. And you allow whatever is in it to infiltrate your being at that particular moment in time without it being weighted with the descriptive that text does. Thank you so much. I think that's just a, a beautiful place, perhaps to even bring this together, um, thinking about um, loosening those images from the way in which we so often read through text, even as we've been talking about a very influential text today. Oh um, my goodness. I think, um, I think that choice that you had, oh, we've got somebody who's unmuted here. Um, but yes, that choice that you made to not include uh, those captions is really pretty powerful. And it presents a whole new formation of the way that we can read and engage with these works. And it's, it's, it helps now to get a sense of how people chose those pieces, um, that they really were dislocated uh, from those captions, from those texts. So thank you so much. I just want to thank everyone for your contributions today, our wonderful panelists, uh, Dahlia for moderating, Odette for bringing this project uh, to, to the world and to fruition and, to, and bringing all of these wonderful folks together. So thank you everyone for being here and to all our participants. And just to let you know that we will have a recording available in a few days um, that we can also share with you. And we'd love to keep the conversation going in other ways. And if you're in Houston, make sure you check out the exhibition and we can send out links also to the publication. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.